Amen. So there in Titus uh, chapter number 2, the first thing I'm going to point out there is in verse 1 where he says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. So this is the things that he's telling Titus to speak. He's saying, speak these things. And these are the things that become sound doctrine. So everything that follows here, of course, you know, that includes a lot of other different things in the Bible, but specifically here in Titus chapter 2, he's saying these things that you're going to speak are the things that become sound doctrine. And these are the things that he is charging him to speak. So, you know, as a preacher, you would read this and think that's probably something I need to cover too. You know, if it's good enough for Titus, if Paul is telling him, hey, these are the things you need to preach on, this is the sound doctrine that you need to put the brethren in remembrance of, you know, that's probably a good, you know, uh, subject matter for a sermon, and hence tonight's sermon. And what is it that he taught him to, uh, to teach there? What is it the things that he commanded him to speak? He says, verse 2, that the aged men be sober. And if you go through this list, you'll see that that is what he's, pre you know, that's what he's commanding him to, to, to teach here, is that all these different groups of people be sober. And that's what I'm going to preach to you about tonight. That's the same thing that I'm going to speak. That's the sound doctrine that we're going to go over tonight is this topic of sobriety, okay? And sobriety, obviously, most of us understand sobriety simply just to be mean to be, you know, sober in the sense that we don't, we're not under the influence of drugs or alcohol. And obviously, that's a very relevant definition. That's something that even the Bible talks about, that we are to be free and clear of drugs and alcohol, that we are to be sober-minded in that sense. But sober also means to be serious. And I'm going to cover both definitions tonight. In fact, you know, if you just go to the dictionary, the Bible says to be sober simply means to be serious, to be so, uh, sensible, to be solemn, and to be sincere. And we'll see that's how the Bible uses this definition as well. It tells us to be a very sober person or what the Bible calls grave. You know, we should be serious about our Christian life. We should be serious about the things of God. We should be serious about how we conduct ourselves we should take life seriously. Okay? I'm not saying we should never uh, joke or have fun or anything like that. Obviously, there's always a time and place for that. But we don't want to be one of these people where everything's a joke, where life's just kind of a game. You know, life is a game that you play. I, I'm, I'm, we're always giving our kids a hard time about that because they're always playing that game called life, right? And I'm always reminding them, life is not a game, although it is. Okay, but you know what I mean. We need, that's how we need to approach life. Don't treat your actual life. You know, when you put the board game away and put it back on the shelf, it's time to get serious about life, the actual thing that we live, and, and not to treat, you know, life like it's some kind of game that you're playing. You know, life is something that you should be ser uh, serious about. It's something that you should be sober about, okay? So that's one definition of the word serious, to be, uh, uh, or excuse me, sober, to be serious, to be sensible, to be solemn. Right? To, to have gravity, to be sincere. And also, obviously, there's the, the, probably the more familiar meaning that we would use today, to be free from alcohol. Okay? And if you would, go over to, keep something there in Titus, but go over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And really, to be serious or to be sober simply means to be in your right mind. Okay? To be in your right mind. To have, to be sensible, to be uh, you know, sober is to be in your right mind, to not have your thinking clouded and to not be, at what the Bible says, beside yourself. Okay, that's a, that's a term that the Bible uses when it's trying to describe somebody as being crazy or someone who's not sober, somebody who's uh, not in their right mind. Okay, they are described as beside themselves. For example, in Mark, you're going to 2 Corinthians 5. It says of Jesus, when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him for they said, he is beside himself. You can say, what does that mean? Meaning he's like beside himself, like he's outside of himself. He's detached himself from his, his mind and his body are, you know, somehow detached. He's, he's not a whole person. He's beside himself. He's mad. He's crazy. That's kind of what the Bible is expressing there. That's what that, you know, that, uh, that phrase means. It says there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, look at verse 13. For whether we be beside ourselves, so there's that phrase again, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. So you can see how he's contrasting these two phrases with each other. He's saying whether we be, be beside ourselves or, what, or whether we be sober. So to not be sober means to be beside yourself. It means you're not in your right mind, okay? Isn't that what he's kind of expressing here? That's what he's saying. Look, if we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. 
You know, if you think we're crazy, it's for God. If you think we're sober, it's for your case. And I'm just using this passage, that, that verse there, to kind of get the meaning across, to get the definition of this word sober. So we can see here from 2 Corinthians 5 that to be beside yourself or to be out of your mind is the opposite of being sober. Therefore, being sober would mean, mean that you are not beside yourself, that you are in your right mind. Okay? And look, that's a very good definition because it, it, here's the thing. It fits, it fits in with the definition of being free of drugs and alcohol. right? Because a person who's taking drugs and alcohol is not in their right mind. You can't take some kind of a substance that affects your, you know, your neurology, your brain, the way your brain functions, and then say you're in your right mind. Okay, you've just impaired that. Okay. <laughs> Another example of this, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, would be when Paul was testifying and he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth words of truth and soberness. He's saying, I'm not mad. I'm not beside myself. I'm speaking the words of what? Truth. And soberness. So I'm just using this again to get us a definition of the word sober. Okay, to be sober is to be the opposite of mad. To be sober is to be the opposite of beside yourself. To be sober is to be in your right mind. Okay, and that fits both definitions of both being a person who is serious and sensible and solemn and sincere. It also fits the definition of a person who is free from alcohol and drugs. Okay. You can see how that would fit both definitions because if you're beside yourself, if you're mad, you know, you're certainly not a serious person, right? What do they call, you know, and I don't mean this in a degrading way, okay, but what do you call people a lot of times would go to the insane asylum, right? They would call it the loony bin, right? <laughs> they, that they would say they would make fun of that. You wouldn't say the people in there and the way they're behaving are, are very serious people and I understand they have problems. I'm not making light of it, okay? But I'm just trying to get the point across that this definition fits both, uh, or this term fits both definitions. Be sober. If you're not sober, then you're not taking life seriously. If you're not sober, then you know you could be under the influence of drugs and alcohol. So it, it fits both, okay? And it's important to understand both definitions because people will go to the Bible and say, well, I'm sober because I don't take drugs and alcohol. Therefore, I'm fulfilling this commandment. And again, this is something that Titus was commanded to teach. Okay, this is the sound doctrine that he was to express to every group of people in the church. So people, you know, this is an important thing for people, and people might get, just say, well, you know, I don't take drugs, I don't take alcohol, therefore I'm sober. Yeah, but are you taking life seriously? But are you serious about your walk with God? Are you serious about the things of this life? Because if you're not, then you're not fulfilling that command, regardless of whether or not of you, uh, whether you not uh, take uh, drugs or alcohol. Okay, so the, you can't just check off one and ignore the other. Okay, <clears throat> so to be serious or to, excuse me, to be sober is to be in your right mind. You're there in 1 Thessalonians. It also means to be alert, okay, meaning not having your senses dulled. And this would probably fall more into that second definition of not being uh, under the influence of drugs, okay. It says 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, he said, Ye are not all, excuse me, you are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch. Okay, so here's, you know, the sense of being uh, alert, right? Let us watch and be sober. So you can see how being sober is associated with being alert, watching, okay? Then he goes on and he says, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. So he's telling us to watch and to be sober. Why? Because some people sleep in the night and some people are drunken in the night. So this kind of fits that second definition, doesn't it? Where, you know, if you're watching, you're, then you're not sleeping. If you're sober, then you're not drunken, all right? So again, just kind of give us the background on this term, okay, to understand what that word sober means in the Bible. And again, it's important we understand it because it's something we're commanded all of us to do in our lives and to be. It says in verse 8, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. So to not, or to not be sober is what? To lack vigilance, right? To not watch, to be drunken, to be sleeping. Meaning you're not clear-headed, right? Have you ever been around anybody who's been drunk? Like who's somebody who's under the influence of alcohol? You'll notice they get that real kind of dumb look on their face, right? Their eyes get droopy. You know, their weight, they shouldn't be, you know, if they're driving, their reaction, it's like they're sleeping, 
right? In fact, they say that being drowsy on the road is just as bad as being drunk on the road. I'll tell you, that's scary, right? But, uh, you know, so again, you get this definition here of, of sober as to be, as being, you know, lacking the clear-headedness, not being vigilant, being perhaps even under the influence of drugs and alcohol. So you can see how the Bible uses this term in both ways, right? It defines, you know, being sober as not being drunken, and it defines sober as being serious about being people who are not mad or beside themselves, people who are in their right mind. <clears throat> you know, again, this is important to understand because sobriety is a necessity. It's something that we need to have in our lives. We need to be serious people. Obviously, you know, the Bible talks about us not being drunks, right? Being a drunk is something that'll get you kicked out of church. And we'll look at it in a minute. There's a lot of, you know, very strong warnings against alcohol in the Bible. You know, and, and, and here's the thing. If it's going to cover something like alcohol, I mean, what is it about alcohol that makes it so bad? What makes it so sinful? Is it the way it tastes? Is it the way it's delivered? Is it the fact that it comes in a bottle? Or is it the effect that it has on you? It's the effect that it has on you, right? So it's so stupid when people say, well, the Bible doesn't say smoking pot's a sin. It just says it has a lot of strong warnings against alcohol. Yeah, but what is it about the alcohol that makes it so bad? It's the things that makes you do and the things that makes you, the way it makes you behave, right? It's the fact that it dulls your senses, you know, and obviously pot does the same thing. Smoking weed does the same thing. You know, I, praise the Lord that God didn't have, that God just trusted us to have enough common sense to figure these things out on our own. That we didn't have to sit there and, and go, okay, don't do, don't do alcohol, don't use alcohol, don't smoke pot, don't shoot up heroin, don't take pills, don't, you know, just go right down the line. Don't snort coke, don't do this, don't inject anything. And it just, do, do we really need God to sit here and hold our hand and tell us? Or has God given us all enough, you know, common sense to kind of be able to go to the Bible and say, well, the problem with alcohol is the effect that it has on your mind. It makes you not sober. You know, and if you're taking any kind of, a, any kind of drugs or alcohol, that are affecting, you know, the state of your mind, you're no longer sober, you are no longer fulfilling the command in Scripture to be sober, okay? And, so, and sobriety is something that is necessary. First of all, go to 1 Timothy chapter number 3 for the preacher, right? It's something that's necessary for the preacher. This is something the preacher is commanded to be, right? And obviously, it's, it, it, it says specifically here in 1 Timothy 3 that the preacher isn't supposed to be somebody who's a drunk, Okay, but you know, that goes for the church member too. You know, the, the, the preacher can't be somebody, as it says in 1 Timothy 3, verse number 3, not given to wine, right? He's not given to wine. No striker, not greedy, filthy luger, but patient, not a brawler, not, uh, but, uh, not covetous. Verse 8, he says, a bishop then must, excuse me, verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant. So there's that idea again of what it means to be sober. Like it said back there in 1 Thessalonians 5, that they are, we are to watch and be sober. Here he's saying that he's to be vigilant and to be sober. That's what a, to be, it is to be vigilant. It means to watch, to have your eyes open, to be alert. And that's very important for the preacher, isn't it? It's very important that the person who is leading the church be vigilant to see what's going on, to know the state of his flocks, to, know, uh, to be able to see the wolf coming, to know how to handle certain situations, to be able to, you know, look out for things in the church. You have to be vigilant. You can't be somebody who's just kind of, you know, uh, just going through the motions or just, you know, not taking it seriously, right? Which would be the opposite of being sober. That's the definition that we just established, right? It means to be in your right mind, to be serious, to be grave. He has to be the husband of one wife, vigilant. He has to be sober. He has to be somebody who is serious about the work that he's been given to do. He has to be serious about the things of God. Again, why, why is it commanded for the preacher? Because he is to be an example of the believers. He is to be an example to the flock. You know, the, you could say, yeah, that's good for the preacher. Amen. Well, he has to be all these things so that he can, you know, teach them for others to be that way. You know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Is that right? Gander? It's not geese's, right? Okay, just making sure. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 11. You're right there. Even so must there, speaking about the deacons, their, the deacons' wives be grave, right? Meaning, meaning sober, or excuse me, serious, which is sober, not slander, sober, faithful in all things. Okay, so even the deacons' wives are supposed to be these things. People that have gone into the ministry, you know, they have to be sober. They have to be serious. And it doesn't mean just free from drugs and alcohol. 
I mean, that's kind of a low bar for the ministry, don't you think? Well, why should you be the pastor? Well, I'm not a drunk. You know, I don't, I, you'll never find me out back smoking meth. You know, I'm, I'm sober. That's okay, great, you know, but that's, that's kind of like a pretty low bar. You know, you need to be sober in the sense that you're taking the things of God seriously, right? Serious about the work of God. Faithful in all things. Go to Titus, go back to Titus chapter number one. We'll see that this is, again, something that is commanded for the preacher. This is the necessity of sobriety. That's why it's important that we understand this term, that it's not just free of drugs and alcohol, but it also means to be serious, to take things seriously in the Christian life and in life in general, to not go through life just thinking it's just a big, uh, you know, fun house. You know, life is serious. You need to take it seriously. First, uh, excuse me, Titus chapter 1, verse 7, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine. So there's that definition, right? No striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, right? Sober, just, holy, and temperate. Okay, now the temperate meaning, you know, he has control of himself. You know, he's temperate. So that's kind of ties in with, you know, being sober, right? Having control over yourself. People that are serious, people that are sober, they don't just give themselves over to every you know, uh, every impulse of the flesh. You know, if you're, just giving, if you're just giving in to every impulse of the flesh, if you're just giving in all the time, just doing whatever you want, whenever you want, you're not living life seriously. You're not taking life seriously. You know, to be serious about life means you're going to deny yourself some things. You're going to deny yourself things, you know, that aren't good for you, although they might bring pleasure to you immediately, although it might be something that you want to do and gratify yourself, Sober, serious people say, you know what, I'm not going to do that because that's not going to do me any good in the long run, okay? I'm going to be temperate. I'm going to be sober. I'm going to take life seriously, okay? So obviously it's necessary for the preacher, okay? But why is it necessary for the preacher? So that he can be an example to the flock. Go back to Titus chapter 2 because as we'll see here in just a second, being sober is something that is necessary for the people, meaning the people that are in the pew, right? The church. It's necessary for everybody, from the preacher down to every single person in the church. Sobriety is something that has to be a part of our life, and it's more than just being free from drugs and alcohol. It means you need to be serious about your life, serious about the things of God. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2, verse 1, where we began. Speak thou this, uh, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, Temperate. So again, there's that term again, temperate, grave, sober, sound in the faith, in charity and patience. So you can see how these all kind of are related. You know, to be sober means to be serious, to be grave, to have a lot of gravity, right? If someone's a grave person, you would say that they're a serious person, right? And again, I don't want everyone to stand up after the sermon tonight and just walk around, you know, frowning at one another, I'm like no more joking, you know? Obviously, there's a time and place for that. You know, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, the Bible says, right? But you know, not everything's a joke all the time. You know, there's a time and place to joke and to have fun and to, and to kid. Then there's a time and place to be serious. And it's kind of like I was preaching about this morning. You know, we're living in a generation now in a time where nobody wants to be serious. They just want everything to be a joke constantly. They just want to constantly be stimulated, constantly entertained. And as I preached this morning, you know, there's, there's blessings in being bored, you know. It teaches you to be a serious person. You know, when you have some downtime, you know, when you, when you need to fill your time, maybe it's instead of, you know, reaching for the video game controller or reaching for, you know, some kind of digital device, right? I don't want to make, everybody's already mad at me from this morning, <laughs> right? You know, rather than, you know, spending yourself, uh, spending your time in just some vain pursuit, you know, may, the sober, serious person would say, hey, maybe I need to review that Bible verse I memorized. Maybe I need to add to my Bible. So it doesn't sound very fun. It's not, but you know what it is? It's, it's sober. It's very sobering. It's a very serious thing to do to memorize the Word of God. You know, it would show that you are, you know, somebody who's serious about the things of God if you actually did that, Right? Maybe instead of just, you know, reading some whatever, some just vain, stupid, meaningless post somewhere or whatever, you actually said, you know, a sober person, a serious person would actually sit down and read their Bible right now. You know, that's, that's the, how you would fill your time if you were a sober person. You know, you would be serious about the things that bring glory to God. You'd be serious about the things that will bring you closer to God, okay? Okay. 
So again, you can see how important this is, this idea of understanding what sober is. You know, that it's not just, well, I don't do drugs. Okay, but are you serious about the things of God? Are you serious about the Christian life? Okay. And it's not just for the aged men here. Okay, goes on. Verse 3, the aged women. Now, it doesn't specifically say that the aged women need to be sober, but it doesn't mean that the aged women are getting off the hook, right? Because it says that they are to teach the young women these things. Okay, the aged women, likewise, that they be as, uh, in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine. So in a sense, there, there's that definition of sober, one of them, right? Not given to much wine. They're not, you know, they're not some day-drinking mom or whatever. Teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober. So how are you going to teach somebody if you don't know how to do it, right? Obviously, if they're to teach the young women to be sober, they themselves have to be sober. You know, they have to be somebody who has some seriousness in their life. And to be an example. You know, a lot of teaching is just done by example. It's just done by the way you conduct yourself. Okay? Also, to love their husbands, to love their children. So we're covering everybody. The aged men, the aged women, the young women. Look at uh, verse 6. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. So we already saw in verse 1, he's saying, hey, speak, speak uh, those things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober. Right? And then we get down here to verse 6 again, and it's like he's, 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 uh, he's telling Titus once again to not just speak these things, but to exhort the young men to be sober. You know, young men need to be exhort. We have to exhort you to be sober. You know, you should take life seriously. Obviously, it goes without saying, at least it should in this church, that you shouldn't be drunk. You shouldn't be under the influence of drugs. And I'd be shocked if anybody in this room was, to be honest. But what about the other definition of being sober-minded, about being serious about the things of God? That's something that young men need to be exhorted to be. You know, and again, in the day and age we're living in, and the, you know, it's all about fun, 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 fun. And all, all the fun I can go have. And that's a philosophy that's out there. Oh, your 20s are just time for you to exper uh, you know, experiment and, and find out what you like and what you're into and just go out there and live it up and sow your wild oats. That's not Bible. The Bible says that young men are to be sober, serious about the things of God, serious about the Bible, serious about what they're commanded to do in Scripture. Take it seriously. You know, don't just go running off into the world just trying to live it up like all these, all, all these other yahoos that are out there. I mean, you see these guys that are, out, that are out there. You could take one look at them and you could tell they're not serious about life. You know, when you're, when you're driving around in public and you have... Uh, and I'll just, I'm just going to say it as lightly as I can. When you have Japanime stickered all across the back of your car, and I'm talking about some of the, I'm not just talking like, you know, cute little character. I'm talking lewd Japanime. Like I saw this week, some 20-something-year-old driving around, just plastered back across of his car, a bunch of Japanime. You know, I'm sitting there thinking, this guy, one, you're just basically telling the whole world you're a pervert. When you're, look, when you're putting lewd pictures on the back of your car, you're a pervert. Okay? It's, it's, it's like, I, it, look, there's a term I don't want to use because I don't want parents to have to explain these things to their young children when they go home. But you know what I'm getting at. Okay? And when you're, when you're some 20-something-year-old or whatever, some, or worse yet, 30, 40, whatever, it's like, good night. Are you ever going to grow up? Are you ever going to be sober? Are you ever going to be serious about life? And you're putting, you know, cartoon characters in the back of your car? It's like, you're not, you're not a sober person. But look, there's so many people that would look at that and go, oh, that's cute. Oh, let's pull over and talk about it. What, what's your, who's your favorite character? There's whole chat groups. There's probably whole forums. A bunch of you know, young dudes sitting around talking about you know, some cartoon that some you know, dweeby kid in Japan drew. That's what you're into. And that's what I, that just blows my mind about these people. It's like, you know somebody drew that, right? Some other dude sat around and drew that. And now you're all, Ugh. It's creepy, man. It's weird. It's a strange, sick, perverted culture that you're living in. It really is. And if you're serious, if you know, you can laugh at it. And I, I get it's kind of funny. It's awkward. But it, look, we need to be serious about these things and not fall into these, 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 pit, you know, these pits that are out there, these, these pitfalls for young men. Young men need to be sober. You need to be vigilant. You need to take life seriously. In all things, he says in verse 7, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity. There's that word again. Sincerity. There's another word that's synonymous with sobriety. 
right? So you're getting a very good idea of what it means to be sober here. How are you going to how are you going to show yourself? Uh, you know, how are you going to show in doctrine uncorruptness if you're not serious about reading your Bible? If you're not serious about studying the Bible, how are you going to live up to that command, young men? You know, that's a command to young men, isn't it? I mean, it, I'm pretty sure that it, you know, that's who that's commanded to. It's obviously it's for everybody. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness. Do you know why you believe what you believe? Why not? When are you going to get serious about that? Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Don't ever let some preacher get up and use you as a bad example like I just did that guy who's driving around. You know, and that's only going to happen if you're serious, if you're sober, if you're grave. So we see that sobriety is necessary. And if you noticed, it was, it was alliterated, right? It was necessary for the preacher. It was necessary for the people. And now it's necessary for pugs named Oscar. No, I'm just kidding. You know, my daughter would love it if I threw that point in there, but I, I just, just thought I'd throw that in there for her, okay? A little, little sugar to help the medicine go down this evening. That's as sweet as it's going to get, though. So we talked about the, ne the necessity of sobriety, what sobriety is, but what does sobriety look like in practice, practically? Ooh, there's another one. I, man, I'm getting better at this on the fly now. I'm alliterating, right? <clears throat> Obviously, it means do not impair your senses through drugs or alcohol. And look, I know I've been kind of glossing over that, but I'm going to park it there for a minute because that is something we have to take seriously as well. You can't, you can't just, you know, because here's the thing. I think sometimes people, they, they, there's these gray areas where they're like, well, it's not drugs and alcohol, you know, okay, but if it's, if it's affecting your mind, okay, then it's something you should probably not be taking, it's probably something you should avoid if it's going to affect how your mind works, okay? And I, I believe that this is at any time for any reason, okay? Go to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. I'm sure we all know these verses in Proverbs, but we're going to look at them again. I'll just begin reading in, in verse 1 of Proverbs 31. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, what my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. So she's going to warn him that there's this way that destroys kings. Now, typically, a king, when you think about a king, you think of somebody who's probably, you know, pretty serious, somebody who probably has a lot of power, somebody who's, you know, a pretty influential person, okay? A king, you know, especially back then, wasn't just somebody that, you know, you kind of just treated flippantly. You know, a king was a very serious person. It was somebody who had strength and power, right? Especially a king like, you know, think about like King David, right? He was able to go in and to go out and to go in and to come out, come in and go out and to make war, right? It wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just, you know, the, uh, the royal family over there, you know, that are just kind of a showpiece for everybody to, to write magazine pieces about. And these were like serious men. But notice that what she's warning him about is a way which can destroy a king, okay? So if we're not, you know, we should take heed to this, okay? If it can get a king, it can probably get us too. It can destroy us just as easily. And look, that's, that's probably one of the biggest mistakes young people make, especially young men, is they think that nothing can touch them. They just go through life thinking, I'm six feet tall and bulletproof. I'm invincible, right? It's not true. It's not true. You know, there's things that can destroy you. And having, that's not a sober way of thinking. If, that's not being serious. You know, if you're serious, you'll realize, if you're sober, you'll realize, I'm not invincible. There's a way that can destroy a king. You know, many mighty men have been fallen by, you know, the, the, the whorish woman. Okay? She can drag you down. Any one of us. It is not for kings, Elimel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Oh, is that it? Oh, is that the, that's the warning? That's what destroys king? Wine? No problem. Nor for princes to drink strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. You know, that's a, the strong warning about alcohol here, isn't it? That if we drink, we're going to do what? Forget the law and pervert judgment. You know, the law is not something you want to forget, especially as a king, when it was your job to enforce the law, right? But even just the idea of forgetting the law as 
you know, God's child. You know, that's not something we want to have to be said of us. You know, we don't want to get into some, you know, bad situation through drinking alcohol and then say, well, I didn't know. Well, you know, if you hadn't been doing what you're doing, you, you, if you'd been more sober and taken the time to find out, you, you wouldn't have that excuse. Okay? <clears throat> so, the, you know, at any time, for any reason, we should not, we should be staying away from alcohol. Obviously, you know, Proverbs 31 goes on and on about this and some other things, but go over to Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter number 23, which is another very strong warning against the use of alcohol. You say, never use drugs or alcohol under any circumstance. I'll say this, people who are in severe pain, you know, I could see where you would administer some kind of, a, you know, a drug in that instance. And I'm not saying like you woke up and stubbed your toe. You know, you got a little migraine or something. Well, you know, let me take some oxycodone to, 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 to numb this migraine. Let me, let me ingest an opioid so I can, you know, not have such a, such a severe migraine or something like that. Obviously, you know, if they're bad enough, you know, okay. I, but I'm talking severe pain, okay? You say, well, why is that acceptable? Well, here's the thing. What, I mean, what does it mean to be sober? What was the definition? To be in your right mind, okay? Look, if you're in severe enough pain, you're not in your right mind to begin with. <laughs> so it's, taking some drug, it's actually probably going to put you back in your right mind a little bit more. You know, and, and I don't want to go on and on, 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 on and on about it, but anyone who's watched anybody go through, like, cancer, you know, yeah, at some point, give that person strong drugs to numb the pain that they're in and let them go out with some peace in their life. But, you know, I, I don't think that's anybody in the room. You know, I don't think there's anybody here that has an excuse to go out and be taking drugs of any kind whatsoever that I know of. I mean, maybe you have some severe chronic pain that I don't know about, you know, and that's fine. I don't need to know about it. But, you know, there, I believe there is an exception, but it's a very rare exception. Because again, to be sober is to be in your right mind if you have some debilitating disease. You know, if you just had all four of your molars removed and they all got dry sockets and you can't even talk and you're just writhing in agony, give that guy some drugs, okay? Because he's not in his right mind to begin with. He's not sober to begin with. You know, the drugs have probably put him more back in his right mind. Get, him, get, you know, get the pain out of, out of the way. I'm not saying it's going to make him perfect. Hopefully you all understand that. Hopefully everyone gets that. Okay, I can, I can move on here. So obviously, you know, the practice of sobriety, which is what we're talking about, is to not be under the influence of drugs and alcohol. That's, that's probably the definition that everybody understood when they walked in here tonight. And we will take the time to look at it again. Look at verse uh, 20, uh, 29 there. It says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? who hath redness of eyes. Now, put that on the Budweiser poster. You know, if this was, you know, if it was Coors Light writing this, you know, if it was, you know, some alcohol distributor writing this, it was some beer distributor, it was some hard liquor, you know, manufacturer, they would word this differently. Who hath six packs? You know, who hath uh, babes on the beach? Who hath, you know, uh, abundance of wealth and good looks? You know, who, ha who has all these great, they, they would paint a different picture, wouldn't they? You know, who's, who's the cool guy at the party, right? It's the guy who's drinking Bacardi or, you know, whatever. They have some clever little rhyme. But that's not the picture the Bible paints at all. The Bible gives it to us, you know, real. It's raw. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? I mean, these are all different things. Woe. You know, you're going to wake up and go, whoa, what did I do last night? You know, whoa, what happened? And then, you, you know, you'll live with consequences that are just going to be, just going to cause you to be in woe the rest of your life. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? You know, who hath sorrow? The guy that, you know, got his buddy drunk and then let him leave the party and he went out and crashed into a telephone bowl and died in a, blaze, in a you know, and it went out in a, you know, a fury, a, a flaming wreck of a car. I know people like that. People that have gotten drunk and stepped out in front of snowplows. And they're just gone. You know, who has sorrow? The guy that got him drunk? I imagine that'd be a hard thing to live with. That you, let, had, you threw a party, someone came to your house, they got drunk, you were drunk, nobody was being serious about anything. And he's, oh, I'm leaving, oh, see you later, dude. And then just, he's gone. And now you're at the funeral, 
trying to explain that to their parents. And you got to live with that the rest of your life. You get drunk, you get behind the wheel of a car and kill somebody. Who has sorrow? That person. Oh, that never happens. It happens every day in this country, in this world. It happens all the time, multiple times a day, I'm sure. I didn't look up the stats, but it, would it really surprise you if that didn't happen every single day, like more than once over the whole, the whole world? Multiple times. People are waking from one day to the next. Everything's fine. Now I have sorrow continually because of alcohol. <clears throat> Who hath contentions? You know, who's going to go and start the fight? The drunk guy. You know, he gets, he gets, all of a sudden, he's 10 feet tall. You know, he started out this tall, then he drank a six-pack, you know, and threw back a couple, and now he's this tall in his mind, and he doesn't like the way that guy is looking at him, right? Except that guy really is that tall, right? And it's not going to go well, you know? And then you're going to go home, you know, you're going to wake up the next morning and go, oh, what happened to my teeth? Where'd they go? They're, oh, they're, they're in the back alley of, behind some bar somewhere where, you know, guys took you out back and, and beat you up. Oh, that never happens. I know people that's happened to. Happens all the time, folks. Well, the Bible's just being dramatic, right? The Bible's just making this up because God just really doesn't want us to drink alcohol because, well, he doesn't have a reason. You know, he's just making it up. No, the, the reason why he wants you to steer clear of these things is because this is what happens to people. Who hath babbling? Oh, good night. Drunks have babbling, don't they? It's so annoying. I remember when I used to deliver pizzas, I, I hated having to go and deliver to drunk people or I'd have to go to a hotel and I remember there would be drunk people in the lobby. They'd get in the elevator with me and they would just talk like you're not even there. It's like, good night. Or when I used to do ride share, that's when I quit ride share. And I saw, you know, or I wouldn't go past 1030. I said, when I started doing ride shares, I was like, I'm done after 1030 because the drunks just got worse and worse as the night go on. By two o'clock in the morning and all the drunks are coming out of the bar, it's, you can't even take it. They're the most annoying people to be around. Just leaning out your car window. <laughs> just talking all kinds of nonsense. Just not making, they're just babbling. They're idiots. You know, and if you're, that's why only drunk people can stand to be around drunk people. Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? You know, you didn't have to have your teeth kicked out. You didn't have to walk, come home with that broken nose and that, you know, black eye. Who hath redness of eyes? You know, the hangover. Who has these things? Verse 30. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. It's talking about fermented alcohol. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. You know, you, that's, just imagine alcohol like that. It's, it's a, an adder. It's a poisonous, venomous snake. I don't know too many people that would pick that up and, and hold it to their face. You know, there probably are some people out there, right? Are we going back to Steve Irwin now? No? I won't do the accent, I promise. <laughs> like a French accent comes out, right? I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I still want to try, but I'm not going to try. My dad used to milk rattlesnakes. Yep. At a place in South Dakota called the Reptile Gardens. It was a funny story. He goes out there to get this job. He goes out with his buddy. This is my dad. You know, I have pictures to prove it, but, you know, you can never believe. You never know if he's pulling your leg or not. But he go, his buddy's going out there and to this, this, it's like this tourist trap where they have, like, alligators. And, you know, it's in the middle of South Dakota. I don't know if you know this, but alligators are not native to South Dakota. Right, that's not really something you see there. Right, so they have this, this tourist trap for, to get all everybody to come out and see the alligators and the snakes and everything. So his buddy's going out there to apply for the job. He's like, hey, come with me. So he's standing there in a gift shop. The guy's filling out the application. The guy behind the counter goes, my dad, because my dad's, he, you know, he's native. He looks like, a, like an Indian, right? So I guess the guy was, and his buddy was white. So the story goes that he thought he had more of the look he was going for. He had that long black hair and everything. He's like, well, why don't, why don't you fill an application too? He's like, all right. And he ends up getting the job. So then we got pictures of him where he's milking rattlesnakes. But that's not something you typically do. He's turning over alligators and things like that. Somebody had to pay him to do that, right? You know, we probably wouldn't, you know, but people voluntarily go out and pick up a bottle of alcohol and guzzle the whole thing and they just get drunk. But they, you know, but we wouldn't go near some venomous, you know, snake but isn't that what the Bible says about alcohol? 
At last, it biteth like an adder. The story goes, and this is where I think he's pulling my leg, my dad, is that after he quit that job, his buddy that originally applied got it and lost a hand. So I don't know, to an alligator, but I don't know. You know, Consider the source on that one, that's all I gotta say. It might be true, but you never know with, with, with Pa. But the, you know, it's still, either way, the illustration serves this portion of scripture well, doesn't it? You think, oh, it's just playing with, the, with an alligator. It's just playing with a venomous snake. What could go wrong? You know, what could possibly go wrong? You know, what's the worst that could happen? You know, or, or really bad, like, what could go wrong playing with an alligator? I don't know. What do you think might happen? <laughs> right? You know, or, you know, what's the worst that could happen playing with a venomous snake? Now I'd have to fall over and, you know, actually be dead, right? Play dead. I'm not going to go that far with it. And we would say, yeah, don't, don't go near that diamondback rattler, kid. Stay away from that poisonous snake. But then when it comes to alcohol, they're like, drink up. Aren't you going to be a man? Real men drink. Right? And the Bible talks about people that are mighty to drink wine. What they're really doing is they're, it's, it's just like picking up that venomous snake and just hoping you don't get bit. Right? What else is going to happen? Verse 33, thine eyes shall behold strange women, right? And it's talking about women that are foreign to you. It's talking about adultery, okay? And thine, uh, that's what it means by strange, okay? And thine heart shall utter perverse things. You're going to say things that you better hope nobody's got is recording you, right? You're going to say things that you wish you hadn't said. Yea, that shall be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth on the top of a mast. It's a perfect description of being drunk. You know, you're curious about what it's like being drunk? Look here. All you got to do is spin around in a circle, right? Just spin around in a circle. Obviously, you're not going to do the, the, the babbling and all these other things. But if you want the physical sensation, just spin around until you feel like you're ready to puke. And then just imagine feeling like that constantly. Like when you lay down, it just feels like the whole room is spinning constantly. Now you don't have to wonder about it. Now if you get curious, kids, about what it's like to be drunk, and I'm, and I'm dead serious, who would back me up on this, right? No. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. But, <laughs> you know, all you got to do is just spin around in a circle until you, in fact, spin around until you puke, because that's what happens when you're drunk. You end up barfing your guts out. Doesn't that sound like fun? You know, just go rest your head on a toilet. I'm not kidding. This happens. You know, they, 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 oh, she was such a nice friend. She held my hair back when I puked at the bar. I've heard people describe people like that. Oh, I like her. I was, I was barfing and she held my hair back. Oh, he's so sweet. When I was yakking my guts out, he held my hair back for me so I didn't get any vomit in my hair. What's it like to be drunk? Just, just gag yourself and then spin around in a circle. And then just imagine that not stopping for hours. You're just like, you know? And then, then you'll, have, you'll know exactly what it's like. And that'd be better because then you won't, have, you won't be saying all the perverse things. You know, you won't be having the wounds without, well, you might end up with wounds without cause because you might fall over or something like that, right? But, you know, that's one way to find out. Verse 35, they have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Then you end up being an addict. That's the craziest thing about this passage. I will seek it yet again. To become an alcoholic, to become an addict. It's doing all these horrible things to you. I'll seek it again. That's a miserable way to live your life. It's no fun. What was this sermon about? Oh, yeah, sobriety. <laughs> the practice of sobriety, right? This is the, the one we're probably more familiar with, to not be under the influence of drugs and alcohol. So, you know, we got the strong warning there. But again, you will say, yeah, I'm never going to do that. But are you, what's, are you fulfilling the other command to be sober? The other application, to take your life seriously. Obviously, if you're doing this, you're not taking life seriously. You know, you're gambling with your life pretty much at that point. You're just taking drugs and alcohol. You're just smoking whatever's passed to you. You're just going down to the dispensary and getting this incredibly potent marijuana. You're just doing hard drugs. You're not, you're not fulfilling either commandment. You're taking your life, your mind, your body in your hands and just rolling the dice.
okay? And hoping it turns out. And you know what? It doesn't always turn out right for a lot of people. <clears throat> Take your life seriously. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 1. We'll run through this real quick and then I'll close. I'll just begin reading in verse 13 of 1 Peter 1. It says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. You know, that idea of girding up your loins. You know, we would, we would liken that onto like, you know, tightening your belt. You know, pulling your pants up. Don't be one of these guys that sags, okay? Don't be a sagger. Look, if you're sagging, you're fagging, okay? And people don't think, oh, I can't believe you'd say that. You know where that came from? It came from prison. That's where that came from. Putting your pants down below your booty to let everybody know. Okay, do I need to say it? That's where that came from. And if you're sagging, you're fagging. Okay, there, I just coined it. But, you know, <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with girding the lines of your mind. Oh, yeah. You don't want to be one of these guys. You want to gird, you know, be serious. Look, you got one of these guys that can't even run, you know, because he's got his pants so low. You're not very serious. I don't look at guys like that and think, what a serious individual. That person's really got it together. You know, they've really, they, they must, they're going places in life. I mean, look how they can't even get their pants up on their hips. They can't get even get up where their pants belong. They are so serious, right? But we need to gird up the loins of our mind, right? To be, take life seriously. And to what? Be sober. So you can see again how this idea of being sober is associated with being serious, okay? Gird up the loins of your own mind. Be sober and hope to the end... Uh, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the, salvation, at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. You know, being obedient means you're going to be serious about things, right? Look, if you're, if you're going to obey, if you're going to do what you're supposed to do, if you're going to obey the word of God, it means you're taking things seriously. You're not just like, yeah, I read Proverbs 23, but whatever. I heard what the preacher said, but pff, whatever. I'm not going to obey that. Then you're not being sober. Then you're not girding up the loins of your mind. He goes on and says, But as he which hath called to his holy, be, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. I'm not going to take the time to develop all that. Where holy is talking about being separate, being, you know, uh, set apart. Go over to 1 Peter chapter number 4. 1 Peter chapter number 4. You know, he says there at the end of 1 Peter that we are to be holy for I am holy. That we are to be holy in all manner of conversation. You know, if you think about somebody who's holy, you probably think about somebody who's serious. You know, holy people are typically people that are going to take their walk with Christ seriously. Because to be holy basically means to be separate, to be set apart unto God, right? That doesn't just, you know, obviously in salvation we're, you know, we've received the anointing of uh, the Holy Spirit, right? We have the earnest of our inheritance until the day of, of the, uh, the redemption of the purchased possession, okay? We have that. But as far as living this life, you know, we have to be holy. We have to be separate. That's something that we have to intend to do. That doesn't just happen automatically. You know, you don't just become, a, a, you know, a Bible believe, you know, or a, a godly Christian, I guess I should say, just de facto because you got saved. You know, you know who the Christians are that live a holy life? The ones who are serious about it. The ones who obey the word of God, those are the ones are, that are serious, that are sober about their Christian life. They're the ones that take it seriously. Okay? <clears throat> and he's saying here, look, in, I'll just read you from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He's saying, Wherefore, uh, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You know, God wants to treat us like a child. Like he wants to treat us as his son, as his, as his daughter. We have to be separate. We have to not touch the unclean thing. We have to be holy, which takes intention, which means you have to be serious about the things of God in order to do that. Right? But notice what he's saying when he's telling them to come out from among them. He's saying, be separate and what? Touch not the unclean thing. To not touch that which defiles, right? You know, we need to be serious about our Christian life so we don't get dirty, right? We don't want to be filthy in the sight of God, right? We don't want to be that spiritual, you know, boy or girl that puts on their Sunday, school, you know, their Sunday best and goes out and plays in the mud puddle. And their parents are all upset. What are you doing? Right? We want to be people who stay away from the filth of this world. 
And, and look, it, it, it gets hard to do, you know, because it, the devil's just slinging it. I mean, he's just throwing, trying to, 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 you know, smear us every chance he gets with all the filth that's out there. I mean, like I said earlier, you can't even drive down the road anymore without having to hear some lewd, disgusting music come out of somebody else's car. I mean, I love, it, every day it happens to me coming down, up and down Valencia. With, on the way home today from church, I asked my wife, because the, the window doesn't work on that side of the van. I said, can you please, I don't even think I said please. I'm sorry, honey. I just said, roll up the window. I don't want to listen to that crap. <sighs> I said crap from the pulpit. Whoops. You should have heard what was coming out of that car. And it's like, I can't repeat that from the pulpit. I don't want to repeat that at all. I didn't want to think what I was hearing. You know, same thing happened to me the other night, the night before, down the stream, such a road. People just blasting the just most vulgar, disgusting lyrics, putting the most filthy, disgusting things in their back of their car. You know what you are? You're rolling around in Satan's filth. And everybody can see it. And everybody can hear it. It's amazing to me how many people just, they just, they just get on their phones, they just get in front of their television, they just open up their laptop, they just do whatever, they just put in the earbuds, and it's like they just open up their brain and they just let the devil just barf into their brain. Blah! And I know it's kind of a humorous, you know, uh, illustration, but think about it, that's what's really going on there. That's what the world does, it's just, here, Satan, just barf into my brain all the filth you want. And God says, don't be like that. Be holy. Be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. Come out from among them. You're only going to do that if you're serious about the things of God. That's the only time you're ever going to do that. <clears throat> because, you know, it's our, our, our former lusts, you know, want that. They want to go along with the world, enjoy everything that the world's enjoying. <clears throat> but God, the Bible says, the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. The Bible says we are in holy people in the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. That's what we are in Christ. We are God's people. We should be different. We shouldn't just be rolling around in the same filth that the world's rolling around in. Okay? We're only going to be that way if we're serious. You know, so ask yourself, do your actions reflect the holiness of God? Or are you no different than the drunken, sleeping world that we're surrounded by? You know, and to be sober, obviously, means to be free of, and clear of drugs and alcohol, not taking things that are going to affect your mind and, and keep, get you out of your right mind. But it also means to take life seriously, to be guard on guard against sin in your life. How many times did we look at it tonight where it was, be sober, be, be vigilant? Uh, watching, you know, being vigilant. These are the things that are associated with being sober, meaning be on guard against sin in your life. Because if you think that sin can't creep into your life, you're wrong and you're not serious. You're, you're not thinking soberly. Sin will creep into your life. We have to constantly be on guard against it in our lives. Constantly. You know, we, it's like, it's that game like, uh, was it whack-a-mole? Remember at the, I don't know if anyone even goes, is it, probably vast, half the room probably has never even been in an arcade at this point, right? But they used to have that thing where you took the mallet and all the things would pop up the holes and then you, they still have that, all right? And you whack them and then you get the tickets then you go get that cheap plastic ring or whatever. <laughs> you know, you get some stupid toy that costs you like eight bucks. You could have gotten from 25 cents online or something. But yeah, that's what sin's like. It's like that stupid game, right? It's like, oh, here comes that sin. Bam. Well, I got that sin down. Well, you know what? This one's going to pop up over here next. You know, you don't want to be the Christian just sitting there with the mallet in his hand. Just go, oh, look at that sin. Oh, look at that. So you're not going to get any tickets. You know, you're not going to be able to go to the, to, the, to the counter in heaven and redeem those things. You have to be, you know, you have to be constantly on guard against the sin that wants to pop up its ugly head in your life. But who's going to do that? The guy that's sober. The guy who's in his right mind. The guy who's serious about the Christian life. That's the guy who's going to bother to take the time to pick up you know, that holy hammer, so to speak, and, and get the sin out of his life when it pops up. And it will pop up. You know, I've been saved for 20 years. There's been plenty of sins. You know, it's like, oh, I got that one right. And then it's this one. 
You know, it's the sins of the flesh, then it's the sins of the mind, it's pride, it's arrogancy, it's all kinds of things that we... Because look, Paul said, in, my, in, in me dwelleth no good thing that is in my flesh. How can you walk around in this flesh and not have to contend with sin every single day of your life? Well, I don't know if I really believe that. You're not sober. You're not thinking soberly then. You have to think soberly about these things. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. The end of all things is at hand. Be sober, watch unto prayer. So again, this idea of being on guard, being vigilant. 1 Peter chapter 5, I'll read it very quickly, verse 8. We all know this one. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring, walk, a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Oh, just to keep you busy. Just because God wants to give you something to do. No, because you have an adversary who's walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You ever seen a lion hunt? They're, you know, they're pretty sneaky for being such a big animal, aren't they? Somehow they manage to take down these animals that are, are quite quick. It seemed like they could get away. But they sneak up on them, don't they? They prowl. They get close. And then when the animal isn't look, looking, when they least suspect it, that's when they pounce on them. I mean, why, I mean God could have used any, any animal he wanted to describe the devil, but he chose a lion. One, because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm never going to take on a lion. I mean, Dad might have wrestled alligators, okay? But he never wrestled a lion. <laughs> There's a reason why they don't have, you know, the lion wrestler at reptile gardens. And it's not just because it's not a reptile. It's because everyone would be walking around. You'd be walking around a lot less than this. You'd be like, I wish I could pull my head in right now, right? What's the worst that could happen wrestling a lion? What could possibly go wrong contending with a, a beast twice my size? You could lose your head. But that's the animal that God used here to describe the devil. This formidable predator that, you know, we don't really stand it. I mean, I get it. Well, I've got a gun, you know. Every analogy falls apart, okay? But if it's just you, if it's just Mano El Lion on the Great Plains of the Sahara and you've got nothing in your hand, you're going down, buddy. You're not going to outrun it. You're not going to wrestle it. You're not going to scare it. And the devil's the same way. Look, the devil has seen people like me and you come and go for millennia. And he knows just how to work on us. He knows all the tricks. He knows how man operates. He knows what to do, when. He knows me and you, in and out. The devil is a worthy adversary that we cannot stand against on our own. You know, all we need to do is to be sober and to be vigilant, to be serious about the Christian life because we do have an enemy. And if you're going to live the Christian life and just think, well, I don't have anything to worry about, you're the next victim. You're going out. <clears throat> we have to resist him, as it says there, steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Look, so sobriety is something that has to be practiced. It's something that has to be preached, as I'm preaching tonight. We saw that. But some, also, I want to close on this, that being sober makes you a powerful threat against the devil. Think about this. If you are serious, if you are serious about the things of God, you know, if you do uh, put on the whole armor of God, if you have the shield of faith, if you have the sword of the Spirit, now, now you're armed. Now you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Now you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked if you're serious, if you're sober. You know, if you're serious about, you know, girding up the loins of your mind and being vigilant. You know, being sober isn't just going to keep you safe. It's actually going to put you on the offensive. It's going to make you powerful for the Lord. It's going to make you a, a, a powerful threat to Satan. Why do you think Satan spends so much time trying to get people drunken, trying to get people to let down their guard? Because he knows what, what a threat they can be to him and his intentions, his will, right? He has a will. You know, he, has thing, he wants things to go a certain way. But, you know, if we're sober, if we're serious about the things of God, you know, we can resist him. You know, the Bible promises that if we resist the devil, he will flee. But who's the guy that's going to resist? The guy who's serious enough, who's sober enough to acknowledge the fact that there is an enemy, that there is an enemy to be resisted. Not the guy who's just treating life like a game, just kind of da-da-da-da-da. Whatever happens, 
well, I guess, maybe. You know, if you're sober, if you're serious, you can actually be a threat against the devil. Let's go ahead and have a quick word of prayer.